Okay, uh, let's go to our last uh, speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Varvinsky, who is a, a well-known uh, examiner in the European uh, exams, and also a disclosure. He has a very nice voice. He's a good singer, but this time we will not ask you to sing, but you will talk about uh, high-flow oxygen devices. Please. We have a little problem with technology here, but uh, congratulations to those who managed to stay to my talk. I'm not sure which is the most difficult task, to actually be the last speaker just before lunch or the first speaker just after the lunch. Because if you're the last speaker before the lunch, then lots of you might be hypoglycemic, but then <laughs> by next, the successor will be, <laughs> where lots of us will be hypoxic. So I'm not sure which one is best, but I'll try my best to... Um, um, stay for you to be stay entertained anyway um, the picture here is uh, my hospital when I joined it in uh, 2001 and as you can see at the top of the picture is a life a lovely uh, football pitch there and next to it is the social club with a swimming pool and a tennis court and this is the only reason that I've joined that hospital in 2001 and guess what happened to all these facilities now it's a huge massive car park there <laughs> the only improvement in the last days is that it's a huge big cycling uh, facilities there as well. So lots of us are cyclists in the hospital, including myself, so we uh, put a bit of a fight and now we have a, a, a bike shed there to put your bike in. Um, anyway, um, I have no conflict of interest uh, and uh, not sponsored by any of those companies, the devices I'm going to mention today. Um, and a kind invitation, you can see the conflict of interest with me and uh, Tamil here, because Tamil just announced that the, uh, his society is proclaiming that they will have a meeting in Valencia on 17th to 19th of November, and we already got these dates in Torquay. <laughs> so uh, if you can kindly change that, I'll be really appreciative. But I'm a chairman of the DAS 2016, and if you uh, fancy going to uh, southwest of England, and you can see the picture on the left with the wonderful blue flag beaches there. And I promise the weather will be like that, which is on the right, which is actually <laughs> some of my kids are among those guys there uh, surfing. And this is the Christmas Day, 24th of December. Uh, obviously, they are wearing the um, uh, wetsuits, but still it is possible to surf. And actually, the best surf is in December. Uh, and this is one of the uh, hotels uh, on the back of this picture. Uh, we'll have a lot of nice speakers and um, probably a fun run and for those who are really brave, we'll have a fun swim. Um, one of the very well-known politicians one day said, uh, what we need to change in the UK is one thing. And he said, education, education, education. Yeah. And 20 years later, I know why he said that, because before he said that, education, I mean high education in the UK was free. Guess what? It isn't anymore. It costs a lot of money to put your child through the uh, high uh, degree, and especially a medical degree is now extortionally expensive. Anyway, but that's, I'm using this as a very well-known mantra, education, education, education. And you will see how I will progress with that later on. Because in uh, anesthesia, in intensive care, and especially in difficult airway management, for years and years we've been saying, Intubation, intubation, intubation. We tubed people where we uh, uh, needed to tube them and where we didn't really need to tube them. We still tube them. Why? Because we could. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then came a lot of different uh, uh, in inventions, and um, we all now realize that the cardinal sin, really, in airway management is it's not the failure of intubate that saves people, it's the failure of ventilate that really kills them. And really well-known cases for you, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, Elaine Bromley case, and uh, Martin Bromley is now uh, uh, an honorary member of the Difficult Airway Society, got a medal, because Martin, instead of suing NHS uh, for millions and millions, which, we, which he could, uh, being a pilot who was involved in the, in the uh, human resource, human management, uh, decided to start courses as, as, as much as they do in aviation. Martin decided to do the same 
human factors courses in anesthesia, in airway management, and he really succeeded now. These courses are now mushrooming uh, throughout the UK, and um, uh, I, I've been to one of them, and uh, some of my friends uh, across the UK, in Oxford, in Birmingham, everywhere, uh, running those courses. And it's great to kill the mannequin in front of 200 people when you're doing the, uh, you know, a, a difficult airway scenario. It's wonderful. And I, mean, I won't mention the device that I killed that mannequin with, but anyway. And the picture says uh, there, unless you uh, uh, don't see it, uh, come on, Doc, just one more try, I almost got it. It's the, f it's the uh, failure to uh, intubate and actually the failure to uh, realize that intubation is not what you should be doing, that you should be progressing down the uh, difficult airway management plan, whatever plan that is in your country, either it's a, you follow the ASA plan or you follow the difficult airway guidelines, which we believe in the UK is, is pretty comprehensive, but it's actually changing, and next week uh, uh, Chris Freck will be presenting the reviewed guidelines, which will, uh, to, I'm sure to the joy of Professor Toko, will mention, uh, I know from speaking to Chris, will mention that video laryngoscopy should be the second alternative blade that should use that you should use if you are unsuccessful with the traditional laryngoscopy. <coughs> anyway, so the second mantra is of course now ventilate, 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 and it is ventilation that we should provide for the patient to survive. And I'll probably challenge that mantra uh, later on a little bit. And. Um, I don't have to tell you that there are other means of ventilating patients apart from intubating them, starting from bag mask ventilation, starting from Lieutenant Giddell, who invented his famous uh, nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal airway, and I just love this picture. And this is this is the original picture, which is in the museum in uh, in in Melbourne, of an original Dr. Brain's LMA. As you can see, it's just the cut and the tracheal tube with some horrible black thing at the, at, at the bottom, which is then became the, the mask and the famous, uh, famous uh, LMA. And I have a privilege to work with one of the ODPs, Operation Department Practitioners, who was his assistant. And he said, it, it was fantastic. You called Dr. Brain from his little office, which he had at the back of the Operation Theater, to come back to theater. And you go there, and he'll be with his, uh, you know, a, a, a type, you know, a little computer, a first laptop, with his LMA in in his mouth, and he said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just, oh, no. he will be, oh, I'm just measuring how long any awake uh, patient can tolerate the LMA. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's the original idea that the awake patient could tolerate uh, LMA without actually being uh, uh, sedated at all. Um, anyway, so there are plenty of devices that uh, can bail you out uh, to ventilate the patient without the intubation. But sometimes it all goes pear shape, and you come to plan D, to the difficult intubation guidelines. And a plan D, can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, <laughs> tells you if you cannot rescue them with the intubation, with the second alternative blade, with the maneuvering of their um, um, position of their head and so on and so forth, with your all wonderful gadgets, uh, and so on. Try LMA, you can't do that. You do your fiber optic throttle, but you still can't do it. You go back to uh, ventilation with a mask, you still can't ventilate. Okay, and, and, and the left uh, side of the of this slide says, try a, a cannula, uh, a narrow bore cannula, or if you can't do it, just go to the right. And, and uh, Professor Leviton in the US uh, is a great advocate of the right side, and I'm expecting a fantastic debate between him and Andy Heard from, uh, uh, from Perth and Western Australia, where Andy says, no, 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 we are anesthetists, we are not used to scalpel, we are not knife people, we are needle people, so stick a cannula first, attach a device, and then try to ventilate. Now Levitan says, no, 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 this is a closed box, just stick a knife there, it'll hit the posterior pharyngeal, because it's enclosed, isn't it? All the larynx is all enclosed inside. You can't go back to through the larynx because it's hard enough. And then you turn the scalpel this way, you put the bougie, and you railroad to get to kill tube. Piece of cake. And he does it on his cadavers, 
and everyone is, is happy, so hunky dory. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, you can imagine that it's all well if you can palpate the cricothyroid membrane. What if you can't palpate in cricothyroid membrane? Now, now uh, our American friends here are all nice and slim and cyclist, but I'm aware that not all of his, their patients are like that. And <laughs> uh, as you can imagine with the modern BMI of some patients, it could be a problem. Um, anyway, if you look at the left side of the algorithm, uh, number four and five says, attach a ventilation device to a cannula, and then says, commence cautious ventilation. Now I say, what kind of system do you attach to that cannula? What kind of system is there available to us? And really, if we think of it, this is a very old slide from Morgan and, and, and Mikhail, uh, but the principle remains the same. You can either give oxygen or a gas through a flow-related device or a pressure-related device. Now, the top is the pressure-related device, the bottom is the flow-related device. Okay? And some of you, including myself, and believe you or not, still remember this a Saunders injector. You just stick it in into your 4 kPa um, um, uh, <laughs> and pressure and just, uh, you know, you've got a small regulator there, uh, you've got your manometer there, and you just press the button and you can ventilate them through um, a cannula which has uh, gone through the, uh, your cricothyroid membrane. Uh, they kind of all gone, and what we use in, in our hospital is, the, is this, it's the VBM, it's the German company, VBM Manager. Uh, but principle is essentially the same, isn't it? It's still connected to a high pressure oxygen source, uh, and it comes with different size of uh, their special um, um, cannula of different sizes, different uh, diameters, and you can then ventilate them. If you ever use that, you will realize that it's not that apparent of how you can use it. Ah. Still doesn't work. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, have to do with our video. Uh, anyway, um, what I was trying to <laughs> show you there on the video is um, uh, it's not quite apparent how you use it. So you can connect this device and it can go just straight to 4 kPa and it's really, really easier than to blow a pneumothorax on, a, on, on somebody. And uh, the, uh, the, right, uh, the video on the right was supposed to uh, demonstrate to you um, uh, how you would um, use this device uh, with a simulated lung. So the, the, uh, the bag is representing the simulated lung and when you press in the, uh, uh, the lever, it will inflate it. But what then doesn't happen is deflation. Okay. So if the patient has at least partially opened their way, it's all fine. Okay. You can ventilate with this device with caution. Uh, but if patient has a completely obstructed airway, then developing pneumothorax is, is really, really easy. Okay. Uh, flow dependent devices, for years and years you'd read it, all you have to do is just connect a green tube into a source of oxygen, put it to 10 to 15 liters, then you have a three-way tap, or even just uh, kink it, cut the hole, and then occlude the hole, and you can ventilate that patient through a cannula. No problem at all, that's in, uh, in some of the books. Uh, here I was I actually connected that, and I was trying to demonstrate to you uh, 
how it will not work like that. Because even if you uh, have a three-way tap and you start, I was using 10 liters of oxygen just for the sake of the experiment, but with 15 liters of oxygen it will be the same. How it will not work like that because the deflation from that simulated lung is still not possible because the cannula is tiny and even if you occlude the flow with a three-way tap so the oxygen isn't going to the simulated lung, you cannot deflate it unless you start actually compressing on those lungs. And it's easier to compress the simulated lung, it's not so easy to compress the lungs which is inside the chest. So this device is not going to save you. So what can you connect? Right. Uh, as Beatles once sang, you can do anything with the help of your friends. And with the help of Meditech, this came a glorified green tube in with a hole. And it's called Rapid O2. And as I mentioned, Andy heard already, uh, he's got the whole system worked out, but it's not about his system today. But basically, and he also advocates a, a bigger, straighter cannula with a special Teflon. I'm not so sure with the cannula, but his algorithm is nice. But it's about the device that he used. And this is actually better. And again, on this video, uh, the short video clip I was supposed to demonstrate to you, but that, okay, the cannula is bigger. The expiration limb of his uh, device, the Rapido 2, is larger. That's why a kind of a passive expiration occurs. But again, if your airway or patient's airway are completely blocked, it's not going to work. It's not going to work like that. So Andy, being a, a, a shrewd guy, says, inflate the lung for, for four seconds. Inflate the lung for four seconds. That will give you, with 15 liters of uh, oxygen, about a liter of tidal volume. And then wait. Do not do anything. Wait until the saturation drops about 5% before your original increase of saturation. And only then inflate for another two seconds, i.e. giving the patient half a liter and maintain that. So basically it happens about 20 to 30 seconds. And that's a good idea of what uh, it says on that slide, on the previous slide of CICV, <coughs> cautious ventilation. And that's what cautious ventilation really means. And what do we do in a, in a scenario when we can't ventilate somebody with panic? So we start hyperventilating them 20, 30 times, and that's how we hyperventilate, uh, hyperinflate the lung, and that's how we produce a pneumothorax, either with pressure or with a flow dependent device. Anyway, uh, a little help from the basic science. Uh, uh, as TB mentioned, I do examine, and we ask this question again and again about Bernoulli principle and Venturi device, and here it is. Here it is, appliance of science. Remember this washing machine, Zenusi, their slogan was Zenusi, washing machine, appliance of science. I love that. Anyway, Ventrain, appliance of science. <laughs> because Ventrain, uh, reported by, uh, first by Annika Hemacher and uh, Dr. Enk from uh, Copenhagen, is the device that actually in, uh, uses the basic science in their principle. Uh, if you can see on this slide, uh, it's all marked, one, two, three, four, five. So one is the flow of oxygen, 15 liters a minute, going through a device, and there you've got an arrow in. And if you remember, Bernoulli principle says it's, a con it's a based on the conservation of energy law, where the kinetic energy increases, something has to drop. So potential energy drops, pressure drops there, yeah. So it's got to be an entrainment of gas, whatever gas that is in the patient's airway. So Port, far, port 4 is connected to that cannula that we spoke about, which is going through a patient's correct thyroid membrane. And um, uh, the other, other two holes, the 3 is a hole which you occlude with your thumb, and the 5 is the hole that you occlude with your index finger. So there's basically two holes. When you press on it, uh, oxygen has got no other way but to go from 1 to 4, i.e. into the patient. When you open 3, open your thumb, the expiratory ventilation assistant happens and is actually actively sucking air out of patient lungs, provides the expiration. So that is now, at the moment, the only device on the market that actually provides active expiration in a completely blocked airway, okay, on its own, using Bernoulli principle, Venturi effect. Okay. 
So, and here it is. Uh, they've done some studies uh, with a flow of 15 liters per minute. It gives you a minute volume of about seven liters per minute, tidal volume of uh, uh, half a liter in every two seconds via two millimeter cannula. So cannula is still tiny. Obviously, the IE ratio is not like IE ratio of a normal respiration, one to one and so on, but does it matter in the, in the case of an emergency airway? Okay, and uh, I was going to demonstrate <laughs> how it works there uh, on, the, on the video, but uh, unfortunately, it actually works on my computer. I don't know why it's not going on the screen. Um, have they done anything to prove it scientifically? Yes, they have. And it's mainly, at the moment, a bench studies. They've done some animal studies on pigs. Um, and there are a few case reports. And here it is, the ventilation through a small bore intubating catheter using ventra in an elective situation. Obviously, you start with something like this, which they reported in, in BGA 2012. Uh, this is the animal study uh, by the original uh, inventors. Uh, using a long catheter, so they thought, okay, can we use it in the ENT? And they use a long, tiny catheter going through uh, a vocal cords, and the intersection was operating, it still works. Um, and then uh, this is the uh, study on pigs uh, on open, partially obstructed, and totally closed airway. So all pigs survived, survived. so it, it works. And in Barcelona, in ESA, uh, I picked up this couple of um, case reports where transtracheal jet ventilation was used in a patient with a severe upper airway obstruction and uh, in a cunt intubate, cunt ventilate scenario. So it was used on real patients as well. Obviously, I do not expect to see many double blind controlled randomized studies with this device, so all we're going to have to work with will be case reports and things like that, at least for now. Okay, But we all know that the principal aim of anesthesia is actually oxygenation, not ventilation itself. So do we have to ventilate to provide oxygenation? And it almost sounds like a sin, isn't it? Of course we have to. How else? Okay. And some of you may remember this wonderful thing called a ventilatory mass flow. Okay. When I heard this thing first, I thought, hmm, what's that? I never heard of this. I heard of apneic oxygenation, but is it the same? Apparently it is, and I just I don't expect you to read all that. This is the studies, and there's some famous names there. Egger is there, Severin House is there. All these teachers of ours, they all played with apneic oxygenation. And what did they look at? They did look at saturation. They did look at the, uh, well, obviously the retention of the CO2 and stuff like that, on circulatory response, on pulmonary blood flow, and, and many, many other things. Um, and the... Um, uh, a ventilatory mass flow was introduced in as long as 19 uh, 1908 uh, and then Prumin in 1959 introduced the term apneic oxygenation. Uh, Draper and Whitehead called it diffusion respiration. But the principle is here, it's very interesting. It says it's physiological phenomenon which provided that a patient air passage way exists between the lungs and exterior. The difference between the alveolar rates of oxygen removal and carbon dioxide excretion generates negative pressure that actually draws oxygen into the lungs. So we can oxygenate without ventilation, but is there a price? Of course it is, there's always a price for everything, isn't it? It sounds great, but what about CO2 retention? What about hypercapnia? And this is again a famous graph from the basic sciences telling us what happens <coughs> with your, in this case, cerebral blood flow if the CO2 goes up, oxygen goes down, which is uh, in our case doesn't. But all these things basically lead to awful outcome if we don't do anything about it. So early studies by all these famous uh, predecessors of ours shown that apneic oxygenation could largely match the oxygen demands of the patient. They did not prevent the rapid and dangerous uh, retention of the CO2. And in Fruman experiments, actually two of eight uh, human trials were stopped because of very dangerous levels of the, of the CO2. And in uh, other study, um, one of the dog died as well, even the dog died. Um, so they basically concluded, one of the studies concluded that classical apneic oxygenation causes progressive respiratory acidosis, rapidly overwhelms the blood buffering mechanism, progresses to acidosis and can be fatal. And 
the important thing that they gave us is the rate of the CO2 rise. Okay? And they reported 0.35 to 0.45 kPa per minute. Now, mind you, they were using the oxygen flows that were available to them at the time. And what was available at the time is max 15 liters per minute. So that's what they were using. So if they don't breathe, uh, patients don't breathe, you provide 15 liters per minute, the rise will be at this, okay, 0.35 to 0.45. Okay, and it's basically, they said, classic apnea oxygenation is like as if the airways are completely abstracted. Okay, okay. So, flow does really matter. With the nasal prongs, what you can deliver is 15 liters per minute. And it's pretty useless, unless you're doing something which we use in our hospital, and we call it noddy, uh, nasal oxygenation during intubation. So, we pre-oxygenate them, like you normally do, plus we put them uh, nasal prongs with 15 liters, well, we'll start with five, because it's very difficult for the awake patient to tolerate 15 liters per minute. It is very irritable to the upper airway. And once they go to sleep, we increase it to 15 liters per minute, and it still helps, okay? Up until we got this device, and uh, it's already been mentioned that uh, this uh, the system like that, delivered high flow oxygen, are uh, used a lot in patients uh, in intensive care. But has it been used um, uh, anywhere else? Uh, there's not just OptiFlow available on the market, there are other devices, we just happen to have one. So it's been used as an alternative to BiPAP, to CPAP, to wind the patient from the ventilator with the humidified air uh, up to 70 liters per minute. Optimal humidity, we know the numbers again. Um, optimal temperature, 37, 44 milligrams per liter of humidity we're aiming for, what, and these devices are providing us with that. Um, so, anesthetists, uh, our um, our own nieces from the UK, from a Royal ENT Hospital, Anil Patel, uh, who uh, uh, done some work, and this is his original uh, publication, calls it Thrive now. Okay, and Thrive stands for Transnasal Humidified Rapid Insufflation Ventilatory Exchange. So Thrive. So Anil and uh, uh, his couple of colleagues used 25 um, anesthetized 25 patients. Uh, with a medial malapati score of grade and direct, direct laryngoscopy grade 3. So they were all difficult airways. So in the Royal NT, some tumors, things like that. Now, 12 of them were obese, 9 were actually stridulous at the time already. Okay, So they were pretty difficult guys to anesthetize. Apnea time was, uh, mean apnea time was 14 minutes. And up to 65 minutes, these guys were apneic until Anil and his colleague were able to intubate them eventually, okay? Uh, none of them desaturated below 90, which is pretty good. Even that guy who was apneic for 65 minutes. Now, mean post apnea and tidal CO2 level was 7.8. It's not too bad, isn't it? Well, up to 15 in, in probably in, in that guy's case. But 65 minutes is still very, very impressive. So, and this is the graph showing the saturation so they were all pretty saturated during this apnea period, pretty well saturated. Now, what about CO2? Here's the CO2 graph. It does go up, obviously, but with 70 liters per minute, it doesn't go up that quick. So it's with 70 liters, it's dropped from 0 0.35, 0 0.45 to 0 0.15, right? So flow does really matter. So there are advantages of Thrive combines the benefits of a classical opneic oxygenation with continuous positive airway pressure, and it kind of um, splits the airway. It creates the positive pressure there and splits the airway open, so allows the gas exchange to happen. And obviously does the same thing in terms of drawing oxygen into your lungs. There are a few limitations. They found it works less. Um, um, good in obese patients, total abstract airway is still a bit of a problem. And they also mentioned, I'm not sure why, they mentioned the base uh, of skull fracture. You, you, know, you can think of one or two reasons for that. Um, so in conclusion, uh, uh, they said Thrive could really maintain oxygen saturation after commencement, and it can actually change your uh, 
pre-oxygenation, your induction to anesthesia, especially in patients with difficult airway from a hurried stop-start kind of scenario to a very nice and smooth event. When you are not hurried, you know that you're not they're now going to desaturate. It's not the three minutes window that you have after you just normally pre-oxygenated. You have a lot of time to achieve your intubations. You are not in a hurry. And uh, I now done a couple of patients with uh, Noddy, and I've done about 10 now with Thrive, uh, completely, uh, uh, patient completely uh, apneic for up to 10, 15 minutes, with no problem at all, mainly for ENT, mainly for max fax procedures. So uh, I'm coming from a practical point of view, and I'm um, telling you that it does actually work. Uh, so the final conclusion is oxygenation is possible without the ventilation. Now we knew that, however, uh, we now confirmed again that the basic science is our friend and Bernoulli with Venturi actually saves lives again. There are other devices on the market as you know where it's used. Uh, pressure driven devices could be dangerous so I'm warning you about all the Saunders injectants or VBM or whatever. And flow matters at all. I know that today there will be a talk on a low flow anesthesia where it saves money. Uh, here high flow actually saves lives. High flow saves lives by preventing the CO2 retention. And there's got to be another conclusion after final conclusion. Uh, and that's what I have to, try to say, is that we really have to now start talking about can't ventilate, can't oxygenate, rather than can't ventilate, can't intubate, can't ventilate. Should we replace the term at all? Uh, Andy Heard, in his little corner of Western Australia, already done that. His courses and his idea is actually is can't intubate, can't oxygenate. And I think this group is really working on it. So the mantra number three is oxygenation, oxygenation, <laughs> oxygenation. And with this, I leave you to any questions you'd like to ask. Thank you for your attention. Questions? 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 The Australians have done some uh, studies. Speak to the microphone. I'm sorry. Very interesting and uh, practical lecture, and uh, I recognize I didn't know about these uh, two last uh, devices, and they could help a lot. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I have doubt about performing uh, something on the cricoid. Uh, by an anesthesiologist because he, has, he is not very familiar with this region. And uh, in a study done by an Australian group on sheep, they found that uh, even with normal neck and extension, the rate of uh, isolation of, because uh, they injected dye and they saw if they performed the correct, the rate of uh, correct uh, performance of cricothyrotomy uh, was very low. So personally, in my career, we had uh, two cases of uh, failed intubation uh, oxygenation in my uh, department. And in both time, we, we, we had uh, available, uh, readily available an ENT surgeon and they performed tracheostomy or surgical cricothyrotomy. I think if we uh, have such a scenario, we should call for help, as, uh, as uh, John Doyle said, uh, don't wait for a patient to, be, to have an elegant neck, but uh, be die, dead. So uh, I think in my opinion is uh, that if we have, uh, if we have a an ENT surgeon readily available, we should use uh, to call him. What's your opinion? Are you an ENT surgeon? I'm not an, e I'm not an ENT surgeon, uh, and luckily we do have an ENT surgeon in our hospital. What you're going to do if there isn't an ENT surgeon in your hospital? Do you all have ENT surgery in the hospital that you work? Most, most of you. Yes, most yes. of you, okay. Very lucky. You know, I worked yeah, in the, always. very lucky. Uh, I worked in, in Russia in a big hospital where there were all departments, card everything. 
but ENT was in a separate hospital elsewhere. What do you do? You teach yourself how to do a tracheostomy, formal tracheostomy, and when I was an attendant of the inter in the intensive care unit, that's what I did, about 50 per year. So I can do a tracheostomy myself, but that's, that's not, the, that's not the, uh, the answer, isn't it? The answer is, what are you gonna do when there isn't a help, or he's at home and he's on a golf course or something? And uh, the, uh, the airway has to be secured, okay? I've secured it once with a um, another device called um, uh, oh gosh, uh, uh, well basically it's the four millimeter uh, knee, uh, cast, catheter the open, not not the rubber seam, the 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 white bore, um, the white bore, crico crico. Not Melka. Actually, Melka is good, but it's a different one that no, we it's use. The Melka, Melka, DBM. Uh, no, uh, no, it's, it's made by Portex. Anyway, the, this principle is the same. You got a cannula over needle, okay, with a different diameter. So it's either narrow bore or wide bore. And now, when I was uh, uh, an SHO in Gloucester in, uh, in the 90s, uh, it was easy. We all went to mortuary and we practice every month. It was no problem. Now, in the UK, to practice on cadavers. Is a, is a major ethical and whatever problem. So how do we train our junior anesthetists? Yeah, how to perform the crack throat. So uh, we now started the course called Can't Intubate, Can't Oxygenate, and we use animal tissues, tracheas, make the, uh, the trachea fat, put some fat, put some artificial skin over it, and make them actually do a cannulation if they can't, make an incision with a scalpel. Uh, blunt dissection, still do the cannula, attach, ventilate. If they can't do that, then they proceed to surgical. Okay, we actually do teach them how to do it, a surgical tracheostomy.